start the recording and if you would do me a favor on your end please if you'll turn off your microphone thank you now you can turn it on if you want to ask me something but i'm really picking up everything that's going on in your classroom um from you moving things around on the desk to the kids outside and it'll get picked up in this recording because we're in the studio where everything is really high tech. Um, there's also a dog in here with me. So if you all hear any funny noises, that's the dog. Um, and he's getting himself settled in right now. So he'll be okay, I think. He, he likes to sit and listen to me talk. I don't know why. He just sits and looks at me. Um, let's get going. So... I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption that right now that a lot of you haven't had a chance to read uh, the chapters two and three in the book, and that's fine. I also want to lay to rest. Um, I had a student uh, send me a, um, I call it a crisis text, <laughs> where she was very upset because she thought she had to be here in synchronous mode every uh, Thursday night at 430. And I just want to assure everybody again, the whole point of taking an online course is that you can be here in synchronous mode, which means you're here at the same time as the class is actually going on. Um, as people who would be here if they were taking the class face to face, or as I've shown you several times, I always record everything, <clears throat> put it in at least two different places and you have the text number. So if there's any questions you need to ask right away, uh, be it right after class, be it Friday, be it Saturday, be it Sunday, whenever, just shoot it out there. So let's take a look at Stratosphere. I'm going to do chapter one. And what he does in chapter one is he lays down some benchmarks, some lines in the sand, if you wish. And what Fullen is trying to get us to understand here is that the thing that is so difficult with technology and education is that we are always behind. We are always behind. Um, and if you think about that for a second, I was sitting in a meeting just this week where people were sitting around tables talking about what we're going to do to up, upgrade the technology in the College of Education, the University of Louisville. And I sat there and I said, you never will. You never will unless you just have a big pot of cash that sits there and then after agreed upon amount of time. And if you look at the data, it shows it's about every three years. Uh, so every three years, if you're willing to drop a few million dollars, yeah, you can keep up. Otherwise, you can't keep up. Now, when I was in charge of all that in Jefferson County Public Schools, we kept up. But that was because we were a very large school district. We had a billion dollar budget. Um, my budget was in the millions. So we could do things there that kept us current. It is by its very nature, that is the way it is. It is a consumer based endeavor first. Technology today does not live just in schools, obviously. It's everywhere. And so for us to try to keep up with it, we can't. What we can do is this. We are reaching a point where we are seeing a convergence. That convergence is that first bullet point up there. It's time that gadgets go to school and schools go to gadget 24 seven. By the end of five more years, the idea of kids having technology in their hands in a school will be part and parcel of school. It'll just be what we do. Um, and the thing about it will be by then we will have figured out how to administrate them, how to control them. And that's a naughty word in some people's mind. I was never afraid of controlling technology in JCPS. I think it's one of those things that it is something we have to do because it is a part of the consumer world. Um, and so we have to have different levels of interactions. It is the teachers with technology who will make the difference. 
when we do module three, where we talk about TPAC, the data that we are getting in on research that's being done with TPAC right now is clearly, clearly showing that this is fundamentally um, what we have to start expecting in schools. Um, I remember the first go around when we bought technology for teachers, we bought them a, a very nice laptop and we bought them a very nice uh, projector. Two things we forgot. Uh, how do you, what do you do with the projector? Um, and so then we came back around and we said, okay, well, we'll buy these very nice expensive stands, uh, desk that we can have the technology sitting on the computer and the projector. And then it'll all plug into the wall and we'll be hunky dory. That lasted a year. And then somebody started coming up with the idea. Well, let's mount them in the ceilings. So you see, you could never change that dynamic. It's always going to be there. But the dynamic that can change, and this is my point, is I would travel around to schools and just do drop-ins to see what was the level of technology integration and was shocked at the number of boxes that I still found sitting in classrooms that were sitting there holding a good six, seven, eight thousand dollars worth of equipment. We did not do a good job. And when we talk about TPAC, we'll again, we will really narrow that down to why um, it kind of gets lost. The other bullet point here that he talks about is students or partners. That's a nod to Prinsky, and we'll talk about Mark here in just a minute. Uh, but these are the things that um, he sees are the challenges. How do we move from that sort of test, uh, tell test into something that looks like this? So this is Fullen's bailiwick right here. This is him. He's, a, he's the guy who created the phrase change knowledge. Um, and what it means is really simple. How do we incorporate change knowledge? How do we give people the freedom, give people the ideas so that they can explore and play with new stuff? A lot of his writing and work, again, there's, there are lines that go from point A to point B in this class that I hope you'll pick up on. Um, he gets his ideas, his beginning ideas from the work um, that we'll talk about in module three that is called TPAC, Technology, Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge, which is based upon earlier work by a guy, my name is Shulman, who talked about pedagogy and content and how they interact with each other. But when you look at what he is looking at, what he wants to do is he wants to look at this pedagogy technology interplay, and he wants to look at how do teachers understand opportunities to learn differently, learning how to learn. And then what we have over here is how do we give people the knowledge that they need of what is available out there? I'm getting ready tomorrow to do a Google teacher uh, certification training for our undergraduate students at U of L. So they'll walk out the door being Google uh, level one certified. And one of the one of the slides that I have in the presentation um, is there are at least 50. And by the way, I'll show you this. I'll show it to you when we get to it in this class. There are at least 50 different things, apps, websites, et cetera, that you can link to from a Google Classroom. Right here, expanding warehouses of information. The problem is we have a really bad habit of just overwhelming teachers with that. And what we don't know or what we don't do is we don't do this. OK, we don't make those explicit connections between technology, pedagogy and change knowledge. Now, that's that is Mike's as Dr. Fullen's term. You could also put in here content. Uh, we don't do a good job of helping teachers see how using a tool in a math class like Desmos um, can engage kids in different ways 
than a uh, handheld um, graphing calculator can. And so we have to make those connections. And he gets a little romantic down here with his mystery intrigue and the unknown. But what he's, he's being serious here. It's, it's, it's you know, f again, five years ago, who ever heard of Google Classroom? Five years from now, who will ever heard of Google Classroom except old guys like me who that's his job is to keep track of all this kind of stuff. Five years from now, we might be looking at Amazon Web Services, AWS. We might be looking at something called Amazon Classroom or Amazon Room or whatever the marketing guys and gals will come up with. But what he's trying to get us to realize is, is that we have to be ready for that the change in knowledge and not be afraid of it. And by that, we have to be willing to sit down and make those good professional judgments that say, this makes sense. This does not make sense. Based upon my understanding of my content and my pedagogy, this is the stuff that I see. So here's, these are what he would call his non-negotiables. And you'll see, they'll come back to us every time through this class. So his new learning looks like this, that it's irresistibly engaging for both students and teachers. It's elegantly efficient and easy to use. There's a biggie. Technologically ubiquitous 24 seven and steeped in real life. Now, hello, that was the dog, not me. Um, the thing that I want you to understand is he's also building on work by two guys by the name of Wiggins and McTeague. Uh, who do uh, something called understanding by design. I won't go into that. That's another whole class. That's 688. But the thing that they point out is they see education as three things. Acquisition. In other words, I teach you something. And then Mike would jump right in there and say, well, now, are you teaching that with irresistibly engaging? Is it elegant and efficient and easy to use? Can the student get to it? 24 seven. And then the guys would say after that, then there is demonstration. So you have acquisition, demonstration, demonstration can be a test, but it, what it really should be is something where the kid, the less steeped in real life, it's application. So it can be a test. In other words, you can drop in with formative assessment all the time. In fact, you know, that's one of the, everybody, no matter how, you know, partnering pedagogy, Mark Prinsky to full in, no one, no one says throw away formative assessment. What they do say is summative should look more and more like something that is applied. But this is a mantra. This is one of his lines in the sand, if you will. So here we are. I'm going to leave it up one more time. So this is his ideas about how do we do this? How do we do this? And that's what the class is all about. And this one, you see it all the time. As I said, in my old job, this is one of the things that, that we did is we went around and we developed a way of, of going in and doing observation instruments in schools so we could see what, what were the, the qualities what were the characteristics of teachers who were the quote unquote innovative teacher? Also, what were the qualities of the teachers that were the ones who were willing to take a stab at using this technology? Now, what we found right away was the stereotypes just blew away, just flew right out the window. So stereotype one was, well, it's the new teachers. It's the young people because they're still plastic in their brains and they're willing to take on new ideas. Nope. What we found was people who were unsure and insecure in their content were not ready and could not be called upon to embrace this new thing. Um, there is a wonderful slide that I'll show you when we talk TPAC about this evolutionary growth that people have to go through before they are ready. The other thing you see is, but you are seeing this change. I call it the entrepreneurial teacher, the entrepreneurial teacher. 
you should teach a class in it. And what we see about it is, is that teachers who have an understanding of what they could be doing differently are the ones who are ready to sit there and at least listen to you. Now, again, most of those folks are content uh, specialists. They really know their stuff. Uh, and most of them are at least they had the, the data that we had. They were at least fluent in at least three different pedagogies. Um, again, we'll go into great detail on this in, in module three. But the thing that we kept coming back to over and over again was we could have an innovative teacher. But she might or he might be doing very innovative things and there wouldn't be any technology involved. And this is what Mike is talking about. He says, we need to develop that innovative teacher, but we also need to develop the innovative systems in schools. Pedagogy and change. So what does that look like? Is pedagogy one pedagogy? In other words, and, and you've seen this, uh, how many times in your career as a teacher have you had to sit through a professional development because the district now has the answer? Well, if we all just do this, if we all just employ this pedagogy, wonderful things will happen. Nope. What we have to understand is pedagogy and change go hand in hand. And one size cannot fit all. That pedagogy is always going to have to be a, I call it the pedagogical dance. It's going to be this sliding in and out of different pedagogies based upon what you're trying to do. What we do know, and that would be under the roles of the teacher, what we do know is that pedagogical change, this pedagogical dance that I talk about, is what drives that right there. And, you know, we know this. <laughs> um, I, I remember sitting in a classroom at a high school in Jefferson County, a good high school. Um, I, when I say a good high school, I mean that in the public's mind. You know, they look at it and they go, wow, this is a really good place to send my kid. And I was sitting in this classroom with a teacher that had been described to me as one of the most interesting and one of the most uh, knowledgeable about American history. And so I came in to see how the um, knowledgeable and expert content expert person was doing with the use of technology. And so I snuck in, I sat back in this group of kids. Uh, and by the way, this was an AP class. And I was sitting in the back with a group of these kids. And yes, technology was being used. Yes, there was a computer turned on. And yes, there was one pedagogy. And that pedagogy was lecture and slide presentation. And the information that was being given, when you look at this, instructional precision was just top door. Well, one kid turned around and looked at me and he said, could you just kill me? Could you just kill me? He says, this, I, I can't sit in here and take this much longer. And, you know, that, that speaks very eloquently to the whole student engagement piece. Teachers are needed, but they are needed as change agents. So the new pedagogy, make literacy an essential goal, integrate higher order thinking, incorporate real life problem solving, let technology permeate. This would be Fullen's stratosphere pedagogy. And if you look at it, unpack it a little bit, you get it. Make literacy an essential goal. Don't just tell test. Make sure people understand. In other words, that second part of that triumvirate that uh, Wiggins and McTeague talk about. Make sure that kids can do demonstrations of those understandings. Integrate higher order thinking. Mike Fullen is the creator of another book that I keep threatening to use uh, called Deep Learning. Uh, it's been kind of grabbed onto here in Jefferson County, uh, and it's going nowhere fast because people keep forgetting about the fact that you have to have 
a level of sophistication in your content before I can step in and start talking to you about any of this other stuff. And to me, that is where we should be focused is helping people really understand what their content is all about instead of changing the content every few years. And then of course, they incorporate the real life problem solving and let technology be everywhere. Uh, for those of you who know me, you're sitting back now and going, well, here he is. He's telling every story under the sun again, because I think stories help. Let me tell you one more. I sat and watched a group of kids do demonstrations through something called the digital backpack. And everybody's all excited about the digital backpack because of this pedagogy. I will give them credit. They know who Michael Fullen is and they know the new pedagogy. But then when I'm sitting there and kids are, kids are up and they're doing a slides presentation, yay, did that out of your Google Classroom, didn't you? Well, no, actually the teacher gave me the, the deck and I was just supposed to put in my information. Oh, okay, all right. Um, let's see what your passion is on the slide that has to do with what your passion is. Well, they, they asked me what my passion was and I told them and they, they put it in there. Oh, well, let's see what your artifacts are that demonstrate how the technology is permeated uh, everywhere in your classroom. Well, here I have a picture of a worksheet that I did. I put that in my, in my backpack because I got an A on it. You want me to get going? Keep coming back to this one. 95% of kindergarten students love school. 65% of grade five kids love school. 37% of grade nine kids love school. By the time you get to high school, it's like, when are we getting out of here? Um, there's also another survey like this where they talk about kids and, and convergent and divergent thinking. Um, you walk into a room full of kindergartners and you give them something and you say, what would you do with this? And you get every crazy off the wall answer you can think of. You walk into a ninth grade class or even an uh, eighth grade class. I think the data was actually about, and you do the same thing and the kids look at you and they go, well, what do you want me to tell you? It's defined it as a race with technology. Now, I have a problem with that one because I don't think it has to be a race. In other words, do I need to have a clever touch, a clear touch in every single classroom? Does it need to be 55 inches? Does it need to be 65 inches, 75 inches? Do I need to have technology like VR and AR in the classroom where kids sit around wearing Oculus Rift goggles? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what we have to do is we have to convince kids that they have to understand and use the technology to come up with new ideas. If all we're doing is just letting them sit and have the technology impact them, either through watching videos, um, getting all excited because we're playing a game online. What's the difference between that and that passive thing that we do called watching TV? Not much. Uh, you know, watching TV is now the joke is, of course, binging because now you can. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could get kids to want to binge on learning? Wow. So when we talk about innovative teaching practices, here's what we were looking for. We need to have teachers collaborate, linking instruction, 21st learning skills. Don't worry about that. Uh, the 21st century rainbow is kind of gone, you know, passe. So we won't spend a lot of time with that, but we kind of know what we're talking about there. Teachers are engaged in PD, hello. This one is right out of the TPAC um, journal. And we'll spend some serious time with it when we do TPAC. School leadership supports innovative instruction and technology. Hello, Mr. or Ms. Principal. Let people try. Uh, I have done, um, since it started in the state of Kentucky, a program where you go out and you watch teachers teach, new teachers teach, 
and you evaluate them. And there is a support teacher, there is a teacher educator, usually a university person, and then there's someone from the school's administration. I've been doing that since it started, and that's been too many years ago. I don't want to think about it. But one of the things that I've always was fascinated by is number three. Um, and watching the, the, the new kid in the building who comes in with these fresh ideas and how the leadership in the building then responds to that. We have a fresh new idea in a lot of schools called Google Classroom. And when I go and look at it, what I'm seeing is it's still a, well, we, we'll let them decide to do it. That's not leadership. And leadership is not. You will tomorrow, Mrs. Smith, have a Google Classroom and I will be in and I'll be, look, that's not leadership either. Leadership is follow me. Let's go try this out. And that's the last one. Almost done. I hate PowerPoints. This is the last one you'll have to sit through. The solution lies in concentration of three forces of pedagogy, technology, and change knowledge. Change knowledge. And we will jump into this whole cloth when we go into module three. Here it is. The old technology you tell and test just does not work. Over and over and over and over again. How many times do we have to hear the same blah blah about how we're failing kids in school? The examples of the new pedagogy, partnering students to work collaboratively, work on ideas together. It is amazing to me when we go and look at places that do this, the kind of stuff that kids do. And it doesn't have to be a, the quote unquote schools. I walked into a building, uh, a middle school building at where all the crazy people live, and we all know that. And I love middle school, don't get me wrong. And this was a middle school that is, you know, wasn't high on the charts or anything like that. And I was wandering down this hall looking for a, a STEM classroom that I was going to be going into and working with. And I saw these two guys doing the look. And you know what I mean by the look. And they were kind of stepping back and staring at each other. And then they were stepping forward and staring at each other. And in their hands, I noticed they had books and they had a Chromebook. And so I just started kind of following them to see what was going to happen next. And they went down that hallway, and we all know what I'm talking about, that place in a school where you go where the things that you don't want someone to see go on. And instead of throwing down the books and putting up the fist, they carefully put down their Chromebooks and then put up the fist. And then I stepped in and said, gentlemen, I think we need to be aware that they're already yelling in the hallway for administrators because they saw you come down this hallway. So somebody's going to show up here really fast. And maybe this isn't the place for you all to do what you were thinking of doing. They just looked at me like, who was this weirdo that wandered into our building? But it just goes to show you. If we do it right, and this building did do it right then there's buy-in. Now, I've also been in buildings where they've given kids uh, iPads. And it has nothing to do with the technology, by the way. You know, it could be an iPad, it could be a Chromebook, it could be a Lordy Mercy. I hope we're not giving out Surface uh, machines. That's some serious dollars there. But the thing that you see then is the culture, is the words, is how teachers and students use and interact with the technology they have. And when there's a culture that says, these are really cool things and we need to take care of them, you see two guys quietly set them down on the floor before they get engaged into something that's very inappropriate. You go to schools where that hasn't been done or it's been done as a negative. Now, I need to be careful with this because it costs $600 and you'll have to pay for it. You go into that kind of place um, and they're just stacks, stacks and stacks and stacks of them that have been broken. I'll let that sit for a second. So what I want to do is I'm going to quickly, not too quickly, but quickly, I'm going to drop down into these videos because what I want you to do 
is I want you to read chapters two and three and hear Mike's take, hear Dr. Fullen's take on what I call the challenges and the bad news, I guess you would say, of technology use in education or just technology in general. And so you have people like this that he talks about in, in the chapter. Well, as you know, distracted is in the headlines. We can barely pick up a newspaper without an article about state legislatures trying to ban texting in the cars. Um, I just heard that Hugh Jackman was in a in the Australian actor. Uh, stop the play he's currently in on Broadway recently and berated. We get it. We get it. All right. Thank you very much. Then look at this one. So this is Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan was an educator, a professor of English at the University of Toronto um, in the College of Education, which is located over on Bloor Street in Toronto. Uh, Bloor Street in Toronto is a very strange, <laughs> it's a very strange street. Um, it runs east to west. Um, on the eastern end of it is where all of the uh, high Rodeo Drive, I guess. You know, all the really expensive jewelry stores and uh, all the expense, you, you, you name it. If it costs a lot of money, that's where it is on Bloor Street. On the other end of Bloor Street is, in the old days, that was their hate Ashbury. That was where all the hippies hung out. It still is. It still is the home of counterculture there um, in the city of Toronto. Well, Dr. McLuhan was a professor at the, and then the School of Education sits right in the middle between the two areas. Kind of interesting. So he was a professor there, and he was fascinated, fascinated by this idea, as he called this experiment in television. And let's just let him run for a little bit. The electronic environment makes an information level outside the schoolroom that is far higher than the information level inside the schoolroom. In the 19th century, the knowledge inside the schoolroom was higher than the knowledge outside. Today it is reversed. The child knows that in going to school, he is, in a sense, interrupting his education. Education must... Bam. 1967. 53 years ago. Oh, by the way, uh, extra points for anybody who can tell me the cameo that Marshall McLuhan makes in a, in a famous movie by Woody Allen. There you go. There's your random thought for the day. This one, he, t he talks a lot about Larry Rosen in these first few chapters. Um, and this is a video that if we were sitting in, in the classroom together, I would actually run this. I'm not going to do it. I'll let you get a little taste of it here in a second. This is good stuff here. Uh, I think every, every school at the beginning of the school year should run the Larry Rosen video, that this video right here. Look, he's even wearing a teacher tie. Isn't that cool? Um, where he talks about the research. He doesn't just talk anecdotally. He talks about research that they did about kids and devices. Let me give you just a taste of it. couple things. First, I'm going to talk to you about why we are all being inundated with issues because technology is changing so rapidly that we can barely keep up. I'm going to talk to you about focus and attention. I'm going to talk to you about our brains from a structural level and from a biochemical level. And then I'm going to talk about how what neuroscientists know how technology does affect our brains. And then I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of advice on how to keep your brain healthy and not support your software, not support your hardware, but support your humanware. Good stuff right there off the bat. Let me let him run a little bit longer. I might jump him ahead a little bit to um, his salient points. So let's take a look at technology. Consumer scientists look at a metric called penetration rate. 
when a technology reaches or any product reaches 50 million users, it's considered to penetrate society. So those of us who are old enough to remember, radio took 38 years to penetrate society. The telephone took 20, television took 13, cell phones took 12, and then the World Wide Web came in and everything spiraled out of control. Four years to go from nothing to 50 million people. iPods took three years, blogs took three years, MySpace, remember that? MySpace took two and a half years, Facebook took two years, YouTube took only one year, and Angry Birds took 35 days. And in fact, what's happening now is all the new technologies that are coming in are coming in so rapidly that literally we are part of a human experiment. We are being inundated all the time, and I could have just as easily ended that with Instagram or Snapchat or Reddit or any of the technologies that within a very short period of time inundate our society. And it's it, it's it to me this is this is the first of his salient points that he makes. Let me see if I can capture up here. Yep. All right. Let me let you see this one. This this is what I meant about what we ought to be looking at, why we ought to be looking at this video. Information workers, pretty much everybody, about a two to three to five minute focus before we get distracted. And what distracts us most? Technology. Look what happens with the number of windows that they open up while they're studying. Again, on the bottom are the minutes, on the top are the number of windows. Notice, by the way, where it peaks, which is at that eight to 10 minute mark where they got the most distracted. They're continually opening up more windows. And in fact, the most off-task students had the most windows open. So remember I said we, we asked them their grade point average, and we thought, this is crazy. From 15 minutes, can we predict who will be a better student, who will have a better grade point? And in fact, we could. First of all, those who stayed on task longer, more of the 15 minutes, had a better grade point average. Not surprising, but nice. Those who told us they had strategies for studying had a better grade point average. That's good also. Now comes the bad news. Those who prefer task switching, working on something a little, switching to this, back and forth, worse grades. Those who consume more media during the day, spend more time on their phones, more time on their computer, more time on their devices, worse grades. And there was one more predictor. Remember I said we saw what was on their computer screen? Visiting one website just once in the 15 minutes led to worse grades. And guess what website? Facebook. Boy, that that's just keeps piling on about Facebook, doesn't it? I I walked away from it five years ago, but this is this video is worth watching all the way through. Um, as I I jokingly say that Rosen is the Darth Vader of of Stratosphere. He's the guy with all the bad news until you get to the end of this video, and then he basically comes back and says, okay. So if we can understand that this stuff that we are surrounded by has changed us, and who was saying that in 1967? That guy. Um, then we realize that we've had a long time. We've had 50 some odd years of this stuff hammering away at us and changing us. And then Larry goes in to tell you, Dr. Rosen goes in to explain um, what we can do about it. This is Mark Prinsky. Let me let you listen to a little bit of him. So Twitter's, uh, Twitter's buzzing away here. And uh, there's another nice one, really nice question coming here about the about the role of the teacher in mm -hmm. today's world. Not just what's the role of the teacher, Mark, but, but what attributes do they need mm. to work in this technology-rich, media-rich New li newly literate world. So what's the role of the teacher? What attributes do they need? And there's teachers watching this who are thinking, I wonder if I've got that. So uh, mm. let's, let's explore that a little bit. What is the role of the teacher anyway? Well, I think the role of the teacher is, is changed to the, from certainly from the giver of information to the partner and the coach and the guide. And specifically, I think that the students are much better at doing the creating, the finding, uh, the putting together, using the technology even at this stage, and the teacher's role then becomes the more important one of asking the right questions, of the quality and the rigor control, of the context providing. 
and on that respect, I have an, I call it an apostasy because a lot of people don't agree with it. I don't know whether you will. I say that teachers don't need to learn how to create with the technology in order to teach effectively if they don't want to. If they want to, that's fine. But the kids can do that. They want to do that. So if you know what the technology does and you can say to the kids, take it away and then judge whether they've done a good job, that's no, I, a good role for the teacher. I, I, when I met uh, uh, Prinsky, um, by the way, he doesn't have a, a doctorate. When I met Prinsky, um, I asked him that his background was if he was a Catholic school kid. Apostasy is a very much a re religious connotation. The, the apostle, the word apostle comes from it. And it's the idea that you leave something for something else. In other words, you, you leave a belief to go to a, another kind of belief. Um, he likes to throw that around a lot when he talks. But... The thing that I, he's saying here, we, we've heard, we've heard it a million times. So I, I don't give the weight to Prinsky here uh, because when we read him, when we, and we, and I don't think Mike gives him too much in the, in the chapters either, but we've heard it, you know, you, we've heard it. But I do like the idea of, and I, and this is something we need to think more along the lines of also when we get further into this, do we need to be technologically savvy experts? Do I need to know everything there is to know about Google Docs, slides, sheets, forms, calendar, sites, you know, that list goes on and on. Do I have to be that? Or do I have to be that person who understands the possibilities and be that support partner, hence his idea about partnering pedagogy, uh, Prinsky, then kids take over. And then if, if I have a classroom where innovation and letting people explore and play, uh, then interesting things happen. I'm not going to, let me let you listen a little bit of, of Clay, uh, because his ideas about the cognitive surplus, again, Sorry about the loud at the beginning of all of these. The story starts in Kenya uh, in December of 2007 when there was a disputed presidential election. And in the immediate aftermath of that election, and there was an outbreak of ethnic violence. And there was a lawyer in Nairobi, Oria Kola, who some of you may know from her TED Talk, who began blogging about it on her site, Kenyan Pundit. And shortly after the election and the outbreak of violence, the government suddenly imposed a significant media blackout. And so weblogs went from being commentary as part of the media landscape to being a critical part of the media landscape in trying to understand where the violence was. And Ecola solicited from her commenters more information about what was going on and the comments began pouring in and Ecola would collate them, she would post them and she quickly said, it's too much. I, can, I could do this all day, every day, and I can't keep up. There is more information about what's going on in Kenya right now than any one person can manage. If only there was a way to automate this. And two programmers who read her blog held their hands up and said, we could do that. And in 72 hours, they launched Yu Shahidi. Yu Shahidi, the name means witness or testimony in Swahili, is a very simple way of taking reports from the field, whether it's from the web or, or critically via mobile phones and SMS, aggregating it and putting it on a map. Sound familiar? Um, what Clay talks about is we cannot avoid the cognitive surplus, the overload, if you will. And so as teachers, we need to organize our classroom to acknowledge the cognitive overload, the cognitive surplus, and find ways for kids to make sense of it all. But at the same time, at the same time, encouraging them to bring to the classroom their ideas. Uh, I'm not going to do Tony. He talks about him nicely in the book. I just want to go over these last thoughts, and then we're going to go through and show you how to look at pick the chart and then we'll wrap it up 
but on tech integration, you can see I've got it bolded here. The integration of technology and pedagogy to maximize learning must meet these four criteria. This goes all the way through the book and goes all the way through our class. Irresistibly engaging, elegantly efficient, challenging, but easy to use. Technologically ubiquitous and steeped in real life problem solving. So what we are going to be exploring from here on out are those simple four ideas and how we can um, go about doing that. In, in module three, we're gonna be looking at the theoretical side of, of the book uh, because, well, we're a tier one research university, but also because we have to acknowledge that there is some really interesting stuff out there about looking at how this can be done. So how are we going to do it? Well, first of all, let me go in and just show you the tool. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the things that we would like you to do with that tool. So I'm going to click on the link here that says pickthechart.com. Um, and I have a login that I give you for free to use. And I don't know if you can see that very well here. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Oh, my Mac doesn't like to zoom in. Um, the username is SB, B as in boy, S-W-A-N, 02 at louisville.edu, S-B, S-W-A-N, 02 at louisville.edu. Uh, and the password is all lowercase, all one word, U-L-I-T-241. University of Louisville Instructional Technology 241 is my office. Let's see if we uh, can get in. And once we land here, we have um, lots of stuff. Uh, a lot of people and I welcome anyone to do this. They will come in here and they will use the pick to chart with their kids. And goodness, just, that is a great idea. You go for it. Uh, and as you can see, people come in here and they create uh, folders that they then can set up with their kids to use. Uh, a lot of people will do it within, um, Google Classroom, because it works very nicely within the Google Classroom. And you can see that some of these are stuff that we've done, but then others of them are uh, PBIS infographic. You, oh, it's just lots of them in here that people have used. So how do we do this? Well, all you have to do is you're going to create by going over here to the left-hand side, and you're going to create an infographic. Now, be careful here. Don't go down and do presentation. That's nothing more than a glorified, you know, PowerPoint or slide presentation. We're doing infographics. And you'll see when we do this, it'll take us into an area where there are templates. There is a poster. People ask me all the time, well, what's the difference between an infographic and a poster? Well, a poster assumes that whatever you create is going to be printed out, really. Uh, the infographic, you'll see what we do with that. We can create it and then we can actually put it places um, that you can see it in all kinds of ways. And then the flyer is the same idea. You know, feel free. If you want to put, a, put kids in here to develop flyers about something at school or you want to use it to develop a flyer about something, you go right ahead. Now, I'm going to do an infographic. And when I do that, I have a choice of using a template that someone has already made or I can come over here and I can just hit the plus sign and I can create my own. So let me start with creating of your own just to show you the mechanics and then I'll show you how to use a preview, I mean a template, and then we'll go back and we'll look at some that some of the, of the students in the class um, in previous years have created. We all need and you can see all this, by the way. When you log in as me, you can see every single thing that I'm showing you. So I'll click on that. And what it does is it gives me the frame. Just give me a blank canvas. 
And when I do that, one of the first things I want to do is I want to make sure that I go up here and I put a title to it. Okay. So Steve chapter two and three. Okay. Um, I probably should put Steve Swan. So we'll, we'll put that up. And now what I have is I have the ability to, I'm sorry, my computer is, is trying to fill things in for me. Now you've named it. Okay. And so you won't lose it. Um, the beauty of using tools like this, as you can see right here, it said saved. So the tool is keeping track of what you're doing and you don't lose it. Now, when we look over here on this side, we start seeing the things that we can play with. So we have the big tabs out here. And so when we click on graphics, what we can see here is we can show shapes and icons, things that we might want to put into here. Um, if you look at the uploads, take a hint here, kids. There's lots and lots of uploads that people have done over the years with lots and lots of graphics that you might feel like using. In fact, here is a three footed stool that uh, Fullen talks about that someone put in here. Uh, you can create a background. So if you want your thing to have a cool look to it, you just click on it. Now you got a background. Uh, if you put something in, you went, whoops, I didn't want to have that in here. Do a right click, hit delete. Now I can go down here to text. <clears throat> and this is where you can start putting in different kinds of looks of boxes of text. So I can drag that over and I can, it tells me that I'll have five lines of text. I can drag it out. Hey, what does this look like to you? Well, it looks to me kind of like um, PowerPoint. I can tilt it. I can spin it around. I can do all that cool stuff. If I like it, I keep it. If I don't like it, I can get rid of it. Color is where you can change the color of things. Simple as that. And then the tools. Hmm. So you're saying I could go out and find a tool, I find a video and put it in here. Now, unfortunately, it if I remember correctly, you have to go find the video, then put the URL in here. You can't just look. Let me see what happens if I type in bikes. Yeah. See, it says you must enter a ballot. So I'll have to go out and do that looking, and then I can throw it in here. Maps works the same way. There you go. You can put in maps. Um, great social studies activity, by the way. And then the charts. The interesting thing about the charts is that if you create a chart um, and then put it in your infographic and then you go back to the original data and play with it, it'll change what's in the infographic chart. Kind of cool. Really makes some really interesting things for um, when you're using uh, tools. Uh, to look at change over time, et cetera. So what I want you to do is I want you to fill this thing up with as many pictures as you can find. And you'll notice that you've got lots of stuff here. You can search. So if I were to type in here, computer, And if I type it in correctly, this keyboard, I've got to change this keyboard out. It's, it's, it's kind of funky. So I might want to bring something in. That would be the picture that I, that I would start with. And then you'll notice up here it says it's put it in the uploads. That's why there's so much in the uploads. So I can move that over and then I can bring a text box in. And what I want you to do what I want you to do is I want you to think about what you've read and I want you to start distilling it in your mind. And so this might be the place where you put your overall, I think technology is going to kill us all. I hope you don't put that, but uh, if you can demonstrate it, sure. And then you're basically going to scroll down through your infographic and you're going to make the point of why all that is. 
one of the things that I want you to think about doing is quote the people from the book. Quote the people from the book. And I don't need to tell you how to do a quote, I hope. Um, let's see here. Let me type in here. Right. You know how to do this stuff. Just make sure that you do that so that when you do do your creating, um, it makes sense. OK, so you're not just do I want your opinion? Yep, I do. But you don't have to rely upon if you find something in that in those chapters that just resonates with you, you use it. Now, let's get it out of here and put it somewhere. So I'm going to go over here, making sure that I've got it named. I'm going to go over here to where it says share. And I'm going to say that I want to share this and make it public. So I'm going to click on this up here. Anyone with the link will be able to view your infographic. I'm not going to password protect it. I'm not putting it into any of these cool things. If I really wanted to get cool, I could go in here and do an embeddable code. We're not ready to jump into embeddable codes. We will. So I'm going to copy that. Now, let's jump into our space. And I'm going to go in here to the Padlet. And I'm going to do a double click on the Padlet. I'm going to do a click on the linky link. And now I'm going to drop it in. A linky link to my picture chart and I'm going to save it and what's going to happen is is that it takes a little bit but it will bring in my infographic into my picture chart and move it around do whatever I want to do uh, up here put your title in in other words your name because you'll notice see it's putting in my name because I own the Padlet put in your name here chapters two and three and then write something. Tell us what your thinking is. From chapters two and three, I think we need to have a good long talk about technology use uh, by students and teachers in schools. Okay. Secondly, I'm going to go ahead and kill it. Secondly, what do you do with that pearl that we just copied? You will go into the assignments. Bam. And here's your first one. You're going to open it up. And you're going to come down here to writing the submission. And now you drop it in. Um, if you need to, you can highlight it. Click on the little paper clip. And drop it in again. And now you've made it to be a clickable link. And that's how you submit it. Let's go back and look at one more thing. Let me drop back into the picture chart. As I said, please feel free to look at um, what others have done for ideas that you might want to have. So if I go up here and click on the big P, That'll take me back to my dashboard where everything starts from. And I can come down here and I can look at what someone did. And they were much more organized than I am. Oh, I get this all the time. People ask me, can we, can we do chapters two and three and four and five on the same infographic? Sure. Why not? You go right ahead. But don't be afraid to you know, pull up one of these and look at what it might, uh, you know, how it might fire off your ideas. This is a good one, by the way. Okay, 
Looks like everybody in that class did that. Everybody just made one infographic and then put two and three and four and five on it. Have no problem with that. So don't, you know, feel free to look at what others have done to kind of get your creative juices going. All right, let's wrap up. What we did tonight is we took our first step into the world of Michael Fullen and Stratosphere. As I told you, uh, his ideas in his book can be very, very simply brought down to those quotes I have down here. Um, and he keeps coming back to these over, he, to this day, I've, I've seen a presentation that he did that that isn't that old. And he keeps coming back to this idea. And in his deep learning book, my goodness, um, the four C's that you, we talked about here, he, that is what became his deeper learning book. It is, has to be irresistibly engaging, elegantly efficient, easy, but uh, challenging, technologically ubiquitous, and steeped in real life problem solving. I hope that my use of the picture chart meets that. And I hope that it is a way that it allows you to think and create. And the fact that it is technologically ubiquitous. And it's kind of hard. Once you play a little bit, this starts to get, it, it kind of sucks you in. Um, that's why I don't stay on it too long, because I'll sit there and fiddle and twiddle with the pictures and the words all night long. But that's what I'm trying to get you to see. When I see you again next Thursday, um, we'll hear from the man himself right here. And then we're going to hear from a gentleman by the name of Phil Schelecti. Phil has probably one of the most famous quotes of educators in the 20th century. Um, school seems to be a place where kids come to watch people who are called teachers work. When it ought to be the other way around. Uh, Phil Schelecti was a Jefferson County product. Uh, well, he's, he lives here. Uh, he was a part of the whole um, original magnet school uh, ideas and participatory management, all that stuff that happened um, in Jefferson County Public Schools years and years ago that um, brought us a great deal of fame and notoriety. Unfortunately, it's all kind of gone away. But he is really well known and has some really good ideas. And then I end up, uh, we'll end up in this particular uh, module with chat with uh, John Hattie and the good news. We won't spend a lot of time here. Um, we will basically wrap it all up, uh, make sure that we're all okay with how, what we're creating. Uh, again, you do not have to get everything done every week. I just want you to see what it looks like and for you to have a chance to say, is this what we're talking about? Please don't ask me if this is what I'm looking for because <laughs> I've just told you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to, um, do the same kind of things that you already know how to do because you've had classes on how to do research writing, uh, quote people, paraphrase people, make sure you cite them, make sure you give them credit. There's no need for bibliographies, any of that stuff. Just go to APA style where you basically put it down there that you say this was what um, Prinsky was saying in 2000 and whatever. And then we'll do our four to fives here. And then we'll jump into the deep end of the pool and we will look at TPAC, Tim, and UDL. And um, that will take us a good couple of weeks because this is where the meat, uh, part of the meat of the class is because this is where we have to understand. So you say we need to use technology. Well, what does that mean and why does that work? And so TPAC will give us a free research focused reasons then the TIM, the TIM is all about the application. So you can use the TIM to look at what you're doing in classrooms. And you can then say, oh, so when I'm using this pedagogy and technology, it looks like this. Then this one down here, UDL, Universal Design for Learning, this is near and dear to my heart. 
Um, this is something that I think helps us with the idea of differentiated instruction. I think Tomlinson, rightly so, has taken a lot of heat over the whole differentiation instruction. I think UDL is what we should have been talking about all along. We'll take a little trip down conceptual and theoretical frameworks, just so you understand where all this is coming from. And then the tool that we'll be using to do this particular module is called BlendSpace, another great tool for kids to do demonstrations of understanding of content. All righty, I'm going to go ahead and start shutting things down. As always, if you have questions, concerns, you're not clear on something we talked about tonight, um, if you're really have lost in the tall weeds, we could meet up in Collaborate Ultra. Uh, I keep office hours one to six on Mondays and Tuesdays for that very reason. So if you need to meet up and we just get in here and you can show me things, I'll show you how you can take over the collaborate so you can show me what you've created. We can look at the stuff that you've uh, put in. If you just need to go back over it again, do not, do not hesitate to drop me a text at 502-457-2937. You will get an answer right away. If you don't have any other questions, let's see if everybody is still here. Well, we had three people. Did we have three people? No, just three. Uh, let me drop in here and see what the any in the chat might have been. Annie Hall. Okay, you get extra points. <laughs> I'll make sure. <laughs> I'll make sure when I when I go to to grade your thing in the. Um, the blackboard. I'll add some extra points in there because you knew it was Annie Hall. You probably even know the famous scene where he and the guy in line are talking and he says to him, you know nothing about what you're talking about. And the other guy's going, yeah, how do you know? And he reaches over and pulls, um, pulls him out from behind the plant. And he, and the guy, and he says, uh, you're a, you're a blithering idiot. That's one of the great all time, um, moments in, video or in cinema, but you have to know who Marshall McLuhan was. All righty. I'm going to go ahead and shut her down. Oh, you do have a couple of questions. Go for it. You turn your mic on. Okay. Um, I signed up for my own account for pick to chart when I was, uh, just going through some of the course materials and, um, obviously it's the free account. So in order to access all the good stuff, I need to use your account, right? Right. In other words, if you want to go in so you can see all the good stuff, in other words, what people did, how it looks and all of that, uh, it, the mechanics of it still work the same. But but if you go in as me, you get the other advantage of under that upload tab of all the pictures that people have added over the, what, six, seven years that I've been using this particular tool. So you, you've got this really nice, rich library of stuff that is directly related to what you hear in those videos and what you read in, in Mike's book. Okay. okay. Can, you, can you repeat the username and password again, please? Yep. i tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put it right here and so that is the You've been so good, Wilson. Why are you starting to make noise now? Uh, here's the username and here's the password. Uh, I've had questions in the past too from folks about um, well, I can't let kids get in here as you because they can mess everything up. No, you can't. But what you can do is you can go in there and you create, that's what those folders represented that were in there. You can create your own class and then you can set it up and say, okay, so Steve Springer, fifth grader is going to be S Springer. And then our password might be either his birthday or it might be just the classroom number, you know, whatever. And then you can let them go climbing around in there simultaneously, by the way. So in other words, you can have 30 kids in there all slamming around inside it, making stuff. Okay. I successfully logged in under that. All um, right. 
And the other question was the, I guess I was confused on the summary of chapters two and three, or I'm sorry, the pictograph that covers two and three and four and five or whatever the chapters num chapter numbers were. Is it a summary of those chapters or am I supposed to give an editorial or an opinion about what they talk about? That's a really good question. What we're trying to get you to do here is summarize in your words the ideas that are in, in those chapters. Um, and as I said, if you look down here at some of these examples, people will, like this one right here, it's a good one. Uh, they talk about technology, power and peril. This is kind of taking, and when you listen to and you read all the people that Mike talks about and all the problems that they bring up about technology, distraction, uh, Rosen is a great one. He quotes Rosen all over the place. Then you can think about chapters two and three is that sort of thing. Um, and then you get down here and it's like, so if that's the case, what can we do? And so that's when he starts talking about how pedagogy of change and helping kids understand the skinny. You see all this terminology that he throws around in there. I want you to throw it back at me and help me understand what we, what he is talking about and all these people he quotes and talks about in the book. Um, no, I don't want it just to be Steve's opinion. It could be Steve's opinion, but I want it to be backed up by the people that, that you find the most enlightening and informative of the people that you read about in the book. He gives so much. I mean, he really does do a good job of um, throwing a lot of people in there and quotes and, you know, you can, like I did, I did. I went out and uh, I knew a bunch of them, but um, I never had heard of Larry Rosen before I read Mike's book. And um, that one just still to this day resonates with me. Here's another go in digital design, digital disappointments, dreams and designs. <laughs> um, the three pillars that's in the book, that's a straight lift. But as you can see, she's done a nice job of, of making it her own. There you go. There's the, the words right there. Um, and then she gets down into here. And she's starting to quote things from down here that she found in the book. So, yeah, if you want to keep it simple in terms of just a simple design, you don't have to get fancy. Um, if you just want to have a straightforward, here you go, just a straightforward, simple design like that one, that works just as well as having all the cutesy stuff. Okay? Yes, sir. That, that answers the question. Thank you. All righty. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that off. Oh, yeah, remember the thing I said, uh, when you go to create a new one and you're going to use infographic, one of the first things you want to do is you want to make sure that you go up there to the top and you change that untitled infographic because when you do that, it now saves it and you'll never lose it, okay? The other thing to show you, because I really didn't show this very well, is if you go in and look at a template, like let's look at this one because we saw somebody using it. If you click edit, then what happens is everything that's in this template then becomes yours to play with. And you can change out the look, you can change out the words, so on and so on. Uh, please don't use somebody else's that, where they've done all the work. Um, if you go in here and let's see. Yeah, here we go. You get down into here, you can start seeing some of the, the templates that are in here. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, and so what people like about using this is it just kind of gives them a background, gives them sort of a structure that they then can start building around. Some people, like some folks will grab this one because it's got a lot of technology already splashing around on it. And they can then just go in here and just double click like you would in PowerPoint. And now I can change up the lettering and the words and so on. And you'll notice up here, this is where all that lives. There's your line up here that'll let you change the font size, all that kind of stuff. And then I can scroll down through it and I can look at the pictures and I can keep them or I can get rid of them, however I want to do it. But remember to change that title up here because what it'll do then is it'll keep saving it over and over and over again for you. Okay? And as you and I both know, the first thing that kids will do when they get in here, if we don't drill it into their little heads, 
change, uh, put a title to your infographic. They'll come back to you and they'll say, well, Mr. Springer, I don't know what happened to it. It was here a minute ago. Okay. You have a great weekend. Have a marvelous MLK day off. Um, I'm going to be starting to teach um, undergraduates tomorrow about what Google Classroom means. You all who are out there in the classroom, just quiet, silent prayer for me will be appreciated because I find that when I teach my undergraduates, there's so much that you and I take for granted that people know about teaching that they have no clue, have no clue whatsoever. As always, if you need to to me, 502-457-2937. See you guys next week. Thank you, Stephen, for being here.